All right, let's go through this. Uh, we've got the same equation as last week, right? So uh, first you want to write the equation. Hopefully everybody remembered from the mistakes they made last week in this equation. Uh, I mean, it's always a good idea for equations, but it wasn't really doesn't help you solve the problem. Doesn't not necessary for solving the problem. Um, I think that's balanced, right? Yeah. 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 All right. So we've coll we're collecting this gas over water, which means what do you have to do? That's right. We have to subtract the vapor pressure of water out. Yeah. So we've got. This pressure of vapor pressure of water and the total pressure was 752 torr. So 752 torr minus 23.79 torr equals uh, 728. We're keeping consistent with everything. And 728 tor is point, I think, 0.958 atmospheres. So we're going to divide by 760 to get to atmospheres. That is an, a conversion that's important to know. OK, so now we've got pressure. We've got volume, right, 500 mLs. Uh, we've got temperature, 25 degrees C, so we can figure out the number of moles of hydrogen sulfide gas uh, collected. So that's going to be 0.958 atmospheres times 0 0.500 liters divided by R uh, times the temperature, which is 298K. And I got 0 0.0196 moles H2S. OK? So then based on the equation, how many moles of iron sulfide did we start with? The same. So then we started with 0 0.0196 moles iron sulfide times the molar mass of iron sulfide. So it's going to be 50, 55.8 plus 64, or plus uh, 32, which is 87. Right? Or yeah, it could be or, or 0.9, I guess, is, is closer, if we're being really correct with that. And I get that that's about 1.7. Two grams. All right. So hopefully you got something close to that. Okay. Let's move on. Oh yeah, you're right. It's probably fine as long as you set it up right. It probably is a grounding error. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next one, we've got a sample of liquid butane. Oops, where am I? Oh, here. Uh, and, we, and we're given the volume and the density. And how, what are we going to get from that? Because we, we need the moles to ultimately find out how much. It, you've, got a, you've got a liquid sample, and it all evaporates. Now you've got gas. And you know the pressure. To find the volume, you're going to need the moles between pressure, volume, and temperature, and moles, 
You always need to know three of those so you can get the other one. Okay. So let's find moles by this is an old fashioned uh, density type calculation. 11.5 milliliters times 0.573 grams per milliliter uh, gives you 6.59 grams butane, which is 0.113 moles. All right, so you, mul you uh, divide that by the number that was back here. All right, get 0.113. Okay, so now we can solve using gas law. So this is going to be 0.113 moles. And the temperature here, 301.5. And our pressure is given 892 torr, that is 1.17 atmospheres. Multiply that out, and I got 2.39 liters. Yeah. Uh, how'd you get the moles wrong? I just didn't know what I was doing. Okay, then yeah, part of it. We got part, part of the credit. Sure. I like, I can just go back and forth. Yeah. All right. So that's the idea. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. What about this? Um, energy. All right, we know some things about energy. You may not have heard this official definition of it before. You probably have if you've been in physics, but energy is the capacity to do work or produce heat. What is work? Or wait, are we going to get to that? We'll get to that. What? No, no, it's, it's just underneath here. We'll, we'll, we'll save up that. I was just going to talk about that for a minute. But let's talk first about con conservation of energy. This is probably something you've heard before. Uh, the first law of thermodynamics, energy can be converted from one form to another, but can't be created nor destroyed. So I can lift up this thermos, right? I'm transferring energy from myself to the thermos, and then it is now higher. So it has higher um, potential energy. And then if, I, if it falls back down, it's transferred that energy uh, to its surroundings, and it's no longer at as high of energy anymore. So um, we have two types of energy that we have, um, that we consider. The potential energy, which is energy due to position or composition. Examples of that are something sitting up on a cliff has a bunch of potential energy because of its position uh, relative to the earth. Okay? Um, a chemical or a molecule has potential energy based on its composition. The molecules and bonds that make it up store some energy, and those, that energy can be transferred via a chemical reaction. And then kinetic energy is due to the motion of a body. We talked about that a little bit in the last chapter. It's equal to 1 half mv squared. So as something's moving, that's a type of energy. So energy can be um, transferred in either of these states and to either way. But there are two ways that you can transfer energy. You can transfer energy through heat. You can transfer energy through work. So heat specifically refers to the transfer of energy. Right? Heat is a transfer process. It's a way of, of moving energy from one body to another. That's called heat. That's what, that, that's what we mean officially when we say heat. Energy is being transferred. When you feel heat, you can say that energy is being transferred from whatever is giving off that heat to you. And that's the feeling that you get of heat. All right. Temperature is different from heat when we talk specifically, when we talk scientifically. Temperature has to do with the motions of particles in a substance. We talked about that in the last chapter. It's proportional 
to the average kinetic energy of a gas and, and so on. Um, but heat can, can influence temperature, but they're different things. Heat is a way of transferring energy. Temperature is a property of, of the system. And then the other way to transfer energy is through work, where you transfer that energy by acting over a distance, by producing a force over a distance. So when I push this over here, I have transferred energy via work. When I hold it and it gets hot from my body heat, I've transferred energy via heat. So what are the two ways to transfer energy? If you've just been paying attention the last minute. Heat and work, heat and work right. Heat and work. And one thing we can talk about is how these, um, how these things are affected via the change. So energy or temperature change is independent of how change occurs. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you're at a particular energy, it doesn't matter, and, and then you're, you're at a new energy level, it doesn't matter how you've gotten from one place to another. It doesn't change the amount of energy that's transferred if you had do it one way versus doing it another way. And to contrast that, work and heat are dependent on that change. So you can think of various ways to transfer energy. Maybe you put some heat in, take some heat out, do some work, do some work over here, put more heat. Depending on how you do that, you can use more or less energy. You can use more or less work or heat, but the energy change is the same. There's a nice picture in the book here. A state function depends only on its present state. Things that are not state functions change depending on how the change occurs. And the picture in the book that they show that is think about climbing a mountain. Right? You climb a mountain. There's a couple ways you could do it. You could go straight up the top, the really steep route. You could take this big windy path all the way up. Your change in altitude does not depend on which path you take, right? You're at the bottom, you're at the top. Your altitude is a state function. It's independent of the path taken. But the energy that you use and the distance are, uh, are not state functions because they do depend on the path. If you take that five mile path of this way, you've gone a much shorter distance, even though the, the change in altitude has, has been the same. Similarly, if you take path A, you've gone a much longer distance, but again, your change in altitude is the same. So it's the same thing with energy and heat and work. Imagine the bottom of the hill and the top of the hill as two different um, states of energy. Right? And then the path can be versus, via heat or via work in any various ways. And depending on how much heat or how much work you do, it's going to change a bit. So those are, you can't just measure something at the beginning and the end and say this amount of work has been done. You have to know the pathway that it's gone by. But you can measure something at the beginning and the end and say this is how much tr uh, energy has been transferred. So that's really the, the, the issue. It's an issue of measurement. It, do you have to take the pathway into account or can you just measure the beginning and the end and, and look at the difference? Okay. So when we do a chemical reaction, sometimes, you probably didn't think about this, but if we go back up to law of conservation of energy, energy can't be created or destroyed. Well, then what's happening when, say, we do a chemical reaction and it gets hot? You mix some stuff together, it gets hot. Is that not the creation of energy? What is it being transferred from? More specifically? The bonds, yeah, the, the molecules themselves. And it's being transferred out into the surroundings around the, the, um, the reaction. So we define two specific parts of a chemical reaction when we talk about the energy change. We talk about the system, and we talk about the surroundings. So the system is the thing we care about, and the surroundings are everything else. All right. A chemical reaction, the system is the reactants and products. What are the surroundings? 
there's there's many things that are the surroundings. What are some of them? If you imagine doing a chemical reaction, mixing some stuff up. The air. The air might be one. What's a more immediate surrounding? The container, right? The solvent. If the solvent isn't participating in the reaction, that's part of the surrounding. So heating up the solvent is an energy transfer. And the reason that that's an important definition of what's the system and what's the surroundings, because that tells us the sign of the energy transfer. That is, is the energy transfer positive or negative? If a reaction gives off heat, we call that exothermic. If a reaction absorbs heat, we call that endothermic. But the thing is, we can't really define that unless we define our system and our surroundings. So if you think of a reaction that gives off heat, we call that an exothermic reaction. But that's assuming that the reaction is the system and everything else is the surrounding. If we went the other way around, if we cared more about the surroundings and we called, like we called this room the system and the flask the surroundings, then it becomes an endothermic process because energy is being transferred to the system, which we're now defining as the air or whatever. So those definitions are completely dependent on how you define your system and your surroundings. In other words, which thing are you focused on and what is the other stuff that you don't care so much about? So let me, before we go on, let me show you an example here. here. In each case, I want you to say whether or not this is an whether this is an exothermic process or an endothermic process and why. And this is cut off, but in each each of these it says which what is the system. So first, an ice cube melts and cools the surrounding beverage. The ice cube is the system. So what's happening to the system? Which direction is heat or work flowing? Is it, is, well, first of all, is the energy being transferred via heat, work, or both? Heat. Heat, heat in this case, right? Because we're dealing with changes in, in temperature. And is the heat flowing, or the energy flowing via heat from the ice cube to the surrounding beverage, or from the beverage to the ice cube? But it says the ice cube cools the beverage. Isn't the ice cube then cooling the beverage? You don't think the transfer is going to be the heat? That's right. Cold doesn't transfer. Heat transfers. So the heat is transferring from the beverage to the ice cube. All right. So if the ice cube is the system, is that an exothermic process or an endothermic process? Endothermic, endothermic right. Uh, another way that we say that is that oops, delta E, or the change in energy, which depending on the type of energy, or can also be considered delta U or delta H. There's some other things. We'll get into that next semester. But the delta E, the change in energy, is positive. There's a positive change in energy when, there's, when it's an endothermic process, when energy is flowing into the system. All right, what about the next one? A metal cylinder is rolled up a ramp. How is the, um, how is the energy being transferred in this case? Work. Work. Okay. And if the metal cylinder is the system, is that becoming higher in energy or lower in energy? In other words, are we transferring energy to the cylinder? Or is the cylinder transferring energy to the surroundings? Into the cylinder, because we're, we're giving it a higher energy position. So is this, um, it's not, it's not really the right word to say exothermic or ex endothermic because it's not heat, but we'll use that for now. But is this then exothermic or endothermic? This would be, in this case, endo again. Actually, the word is endergenic because we're dealing with energy. But the, the cell, so is the change in energy positive or negative to the cylinder? If the cylinder is the system, is the change in energy positive or negative? It's positive because we're adding energy into the system. All right, now next one, you think about it, and then we'll, 
We'll talk about it together. Steam condenses on skin, causing a burn. And the condensing steam is the system. So everybody think about it for a minute. Everybody got it? Okay. Who says that this uh, that the uh, change in energy is positive? Who says negative? Okay, mostly negatives. So why negative? Somebody who said that. Okay. What does the burn mean? Right. Energy is leaving the, st the steam, going into the skin, which is causing the skin to burn. The other way you know that energy is leaving the steam is that it's condensing. Wait. Is that, yeah. It's condensing. So it's, it's going from a steam, from a vapor to a liquid. That's giving off energy. OK? So those are the types of questions that I'll ask about energy. That's about it. We're not really doing calculations with this stuff. All right, let's move on. That was it. I told you, we're saving it for next semester. We don't want to step on their toes. Okay. Next semester is just heat and work for months and months. Are you excited about it? Heat and work. No, you don't teach 122, right? No, no, not, not recently. What? Well, I haven't uh, recently. I, I, you know, whatever comes up, I might do it. I'm not officially in the so schedule. Like, <laughs> so the registration yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So chapter seven. This is a weird, a little bit of a weird chapter. I'm going to change it a little bit this year. Um, there, are, I think, I think it attempts a little bit more than anyone really ever gets out of it. So I'm going to try to pull it back a little bit. We'll see what happens. Um, we're going to talk now about the structure of the atom as it's currently understood. And to do that, we need to get a little bit into physics, um, more so than, than maybe we have. So you remember back in chapter two, we talked a little bit about atomic theory, atomic structure. This time, we're going to talk more specifically about electronic structure. That is, how do electrons behave, and how does that influence the chemistry? So we don't care about the nucleus and stuff so much anymore, because we know all the chemistry actually happens in the electrons. But what's happening with the electrons requires some pretty uh, sophisticated math and physics to try to um, describe. So we're going to approach that as best we can. Uh, the other name for this is quantum mechanics or quantum physics. If you go on um, in chemistry, I'm sure you'll, you'll do a lot more of that, or in physics. But for now, I kind of want to give you a sense of what, what quantum mechanics are um, and how it helps us in chemistry to describe things. To do so, we need to start a little bit earlier and just talk a little bit about light. So electromagnetic radiation is a fancy way of, light, of saying light. It's also important uh, that it's, it's, it's sometimes a misconception. When we hear the term radiation, we often think of Nuclear chemistry, right? And those are very specific types of radiation. Those are, that's nuclear radiation. And in fact, the term radiation is much more general than that. It just means emission of light. So these lights are emitting radiation right now in the form of visible light, right? Uh, it's not scary. Radiation doesn't have to be scary. But it leads to some interesting misconceptions, like people being afraid of using microwaves because the radiation is making their food nuclear. Or, like people, people often use the, I don't know if you've heard this, but as like a slang term, somebody says, oh, just nuke it, like meaning to microwave it. That's where that comes from. It's a conflation of two types of radiation that are really unrelated. Um, or not totally unrelated, as we'll see, but, but definitely two types of radiation. Radiation itself doesn't mean anything dangerous. It just means light. Right? And microwaves, like the microwave oven in your house, is a specific type of light that we'll talk about in a moment. Wait, so is the microwave radiation, is that like dangerous? Or? 
Well, it depends how you describe it. It's not dangerous uh, the way that nuclear radiation is. It's not as high of energy. But it's dangerous in that it can heat things up, which is what it does to your food. Well, like, it's so, not going to give you an answer. Well, not necessarily. I mean, there's, um, there are ways that these types, that any kind of light, I mean, just like ultraviolet light, right? Microwave radiation is not as high energy as that, but uh, there is a chance that any kind of, of transfer of energy can cause mutations in your DNA and, and stuff like that that can cause cancer. So I wouldn't say that it, it doesn't necessarily or can't cause cancer, but um, it's, not, it's, it's certainly not comparable to known sources of nuclear radiation, right? alpha rays, beta rays, uh, gamma rays, or particle, alpha particles, gamma, beta particles, and gamma rays. So we, uh, we, we describe light with two variables. Actually, well, two commonly. The wavelength and the frequency. So if I show you, if I draw a light wave here, let's try to do that a little bit better. Here's my light wave. What is the, how, how do we measure a wavelength? What is a wavelength? It's between the two, the top and the frequency. Right. So we say, here to here is one wavelength. Essentially, if you imagine those folding on themselves, it becomes a circle. If you remember back to math class, you know you can talk about um, waves as going around in circles, sines and cosines, all that stuff. So uh, this is a wavelength. Of course, you can pick that anywhere you want. Just one complete cycle of the wave is considered, or, or the distance of one complete cycle of a wave is known as a wavelength. And in light, so we, we express that with the Greek letter lambda. And with light, we talk about a wavelength as having that actual distance. So um, we'll, we'll see some of these numbers, but very low energy waves with very large wavelengths, like radio waves, can have wavelengths of meters on the meter scale. Very short wavelengths, like um, visible light, have wavelengths on a nanometer scale. But that's what determines. Uh, that's one of the characteristics of waves. And then the other characteristic is frequencies, which is the number of waves per second that pass a given point in space. So that's a little bit harder to express um, graphically. But you imagine a light wave going along. If you pick a, pick a point, and then the wave is going along, and each time the top of the wave hits that, that's another wavelength, or that's another, that's a frequency. So how many times per second does that hit it? So let's relate those two before we look at the equation. If you have a wavelength that is very, very long, what is that going to do to your frequency? It's going to lower it. It's going to lower it, right? It's going to hit much slower. What if you have a very short frequency, or a very short wavelength? High frequency. Then it's a high frequency, right? Because it's hitting it all the time. And this assumes that the speed is constant. And the speed is constant because all electromagnetic radiation travels at the speed of light. So given that constant speed, wavelength and frequency are inversely related. We can say from the equation that the wavelength times the frequency is that speed of light. That's a number you should know. About 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, speed of light. Right. Or um, another way of thinking about that, uh, another way of thinking of that is about 300 million meters per second. Well, what if you don't know, like the miles per second? Though? If you know the miles per second, yeah, but you'll have to do a lot of conversions in your in your problems. Oh, you can't yeah. use that number. Well, sure you can, but most of the problems that we'll be dealing with will be dealing in meters, and so you can't report your you can't report your wavelengths in miles, generally, so you'll just have to do a conversion. Um, all right. So, units. Wavelength is in meters, or some you know, type of meters, nanometers, centimeters, kilometers, whatever. And frequency is in inverse seconds, or one over second. That just means per second. So it cycles per second. 
Now, one thing also to note, the variable for frequency is not v. Anybody know what it is? What? This is not a v. It is a Greek letter known as? <laughs> Nobody? Nobody speaks Greek? OK. It's new. 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 It's an N sound in, in Greek. All right. So that's important because V has a different meaning. V is velocity. So when you see V, we're talking about velocity. When you see nu, we're talking about frequency. All right, so let's take a look at the spectrum. Here's the electromagnetic spectrum. On the top, you see frequencies in hertz. And on the bottom, or in the middle, you see wavelength in meters. And this gives you a sense of where all these different energy radiations are. So high energy things are things with very, very short wavelengths, and very, very high frequencies. Yeah? Uh, this is kind of unrelated, but like, uh, I was Like everything else you've said this today? <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. Go ahead. I did. I posted it last night. Oh. So and there's no prelab. There's no prelab. Oh, there is. Just get get your get your notebook ready for everything. But it's essentially another titration oh, okay. lab. I was sure. Yeah, that's related. I thought you were gonna go <laughs> way way farther off than that. That's, <laughs> that's class. Related to this. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's talk about the electromagnetic spectrum again. So high energy things are high frequency, tiny wavelength, and I imagine. The way that I think about this, if I forget which side is which, is with that frequency thing. Like, if you imagine the wave hitting something really fast, right? If you hit something a bunch of times, it takes a lot of energy, so that's high energy. Maybe that's a stupid way to remember it. But however you want to remember it, remember high energy, high frequency, low short wavelength. And then the other end are the very long wavelengths, right? So something like AM radio waves are out in almost the kilometer wavelength. So one wave actually spans a whole kilometer. Uh, the FM radio is like in the meter wavelength, so the waves are about you know that long or so. Right, like that, yeah. So and are we talking here all about light, uh, light uh, radiation, it's not like uh, chemical radiation. That's right, so th but this is something we'll talk about in a little bit. There is a wa what we call a wave-particle duality, we won't get to it today, where Waves can have particle characteristics, and particles can have wave-like characteristics. So this deals with specifically light waves. Nuclear radiation also talks about um, particles, alpha particles and beta particles, and but gamma rays as well. So those are high energy. That's high energy radiation that that can be dangerous for sure. The one that has long half-life, isn't it? Yes, because gamma rays. Don't, aren't actual particles, so the stuff doesn't break down, it just changes its energy state. Um, yeah, gamma rays are also what we see, or even higher energy is cosmic rays, which are these super high energy rays that come from space, and they come down and hit us, and it's like why if you spend a lot of time in an airplane, your um, likelihood of, of getting certain cancers increases just because you're randomly getting hit with more cosmic rays because you're higher up in the air. Um, yeah, so you should, you should have a good, good sense of this scale. You should know that we have the visible light, which is a tiny portion of the spectrum, from about 400 to 750 nanometers. Uh, you, what? Yeah, you should know. Well, you should know approximately. You should know that this is the range, and the reason for that. Not that I'm going to test you and say where in the spectrum is 540 nanometers, but you do. If if there's a problem that says. Something happens, you know, whatever, and red light is emitted. And you work through your calculations, and you get an answer of 60 meters for the wavelength of that red light. You should be able to say, wait, that can't be right. I know that visible light is in the nanometers. So if I'm not getting an answer in the nanometers, then I've done something wrong. So it's a sense of checking yourself and kind of having a good sense of what these things should be. That's worth, that's worth knowing. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that you want to be able to do is convert between wavelength and frequency um, using that relationship that we just saw. 
So a problem like this, the brilliant red co colors seen in fireworks are due to the emission of light with wavelengths around 650 nanometers when, stra with, when strontium salts such as these, these are heated. Calculate the frequency of red light of wavelength 6.50 times 10 to the 2 nanometers, or what would also be written as just 650 nanometers. So what's the frequency of that light? How would you do that? Right, so first you have to notice that this is in nanometers. And this is why it's important to know all of your metric prefixes so you know how many meters this is. So how many meters or how many nanometers are in a meter? There are 10 to the negative ninth nanometers in, an, in a meter? There's something very wrong about that. Right, it's 10 to the ninth nanometers in a meter because a nanometer is small. Okay? So if you see nanometers, you can think of this as 650 times 10 to the ninth meters, right? Or 6.50 uh, times 10 to the. Wouldn't that be negative nine? Oh yes, yes, you're right. Thank you. Let's get that screwed up. 650 times 10 to the negative ninth meters. All right. So then, what equation do we use here to uh, to figure this out? The one we just talked about, right? C equals speed of light equals the wavelength times the frequency. So the speed of light is? <laughs> Thank you for the miles per second. That's helpful. All right, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And then our wavelength is given. times the frequency. So our frequency is going to be the speed of light divided by the wavelength. Somebody want to punch that out? If you got it, I think I have it here somewhere. And what's the unit for frequency? That's the, that's the name of the variable. The units are inverse seconds, second to the negative one, or hertz, which is the same thing. I know, it hurts. OK. Questions about that? All right, I'm going to stop there. We'll continue on Monday. Uh, with the rest of chapter 7. So see you tomorrow in lab.